provisions for other grants to the general fund. The first witness on this bill is Mr. DeBow. Good afternoon, Chairman Good and members of the committee. I'm Rob Dubo, Finance Director, and I'm here to testify on Bill 130577, um, which proposes to transfer $50 million uh, from the city's grants fund to contributions, indemnities, and taxes contingent on the city and paid reaching an agreement to pay the school district $50 million for surplus property. I'm joined at the table by Rebecca Reinhart, uh, the city's budget director. Um, before discussing our, position to the, our opposition to the bill, I want to emphasize that I think we share three goals, getting $50 million to the school district in FY14, securing stable recurring revenues for the district, and providing some relief for the city's pension fund. And I think where we differ is on the best way of achieving those goals. As you know, the state has enacted legislation that would extend the 1% increase on the sales tax under that legislation, the first $120 million generated by the tax would go to the school district. The next $15 million would go to pay debt service on a $50 million borrowing for the district's FY14 operations. Anything above that amount would go to the city's pension fund. Uh, our projections show the pension fund would get about $400 million over the first 10 years of the tax extension while the school district would earn about $530 million through FY18. We did not advocate for the funding plan enacted in Harrisburg. Instead, we advocated for a plan that would have included the cigarette tax that was passed unanimously by council and signed by the mayor uh, and recurring additional state revenues. The plan enacted in Harrisburg, however, is the only option that gets stable funding to the district without requiring any further action by the state legislature. While not perfect, it does provide stable recurring funding to the district without having any negative impact on the city's general fund and sends much needed dollars to the pension fund. The proposed cigarette tax or any changes to how the 1% sales tax is distributed requires additional action in Harrisburg. For that reason, the administration believes it's important to enact legislation locally to extend the sales tax. Doing so would also allow us to move ahead with the $50 million borrowing for the district's FY14 operating needs while still giving us the opportunity to advocate in Harrisburg for changes, sorry, for the changes we seek to the sales tax distribution and for enactment of a local cigarette tax. We do share council's belief that the district's surplus properties can generate revenue for the district. City officials have been working closely with district officials on plans to sell the district surplus properties and the district has included $28 million in its five-year plan from the sale of those properties. To the extent that the surplus property sales generate more than $28 million, the district will benefit regardless of whether we purchase properties before they are sold. If the city purchases those, those properties and retains the first $50 million in sale proceeds, the district would lose out on the $28 million it was counting on in its own five-year plan unless the properties generate at least $78 million, $50 million to make the city whole for its purchase, plus the $28 million included in the district's five-year plan. If the properties do sell quickly for well more than $50 million, uh, having the city acquire the properties first doesn't provide the district a meaningful benefit because the district would get the proceeds of those sales without any advance from the city. But on the other hand, Philadelphia's experience is similar to that of other cities and the properties sell more slowly and for less than expected, the city could quite possibly not only not recoup its full $50 million, but would also be responsible for the costs of maintaining those buildings until they're sold. In contrast, the plan enacted by the legislature provides recurring stable funding for the district without having a negative impact on the city's and district's general funds, while providing funds for the city's pension fund and without requiring any further action in Harrisburg. Um, that concludes my testimony, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. DeVoe. A few simple questions uh, just to get all this out in the open. Sure. Uh, do you expect this committee to accept your analysis 
found on page three of your testimony? Um, I mean, which analysis on page three? Just well, to make the, sure I'm answering that. Fiscal impact of school building sales and the national trends and what happens if we don't buy them, but the school just sells them? I think that what we're saying here is accurate. I don't know whether the committee will agree, but I think it's accurate. Do you expect the majority of counselors to accept your analysis? Again, I believe it's accurate. I, I don't want to predict where counsel will go. By accurate, do you think your analysis is fact or opinion? Well, you know, every analysis is going to have some opinion in, in, in it, right? But I believe it's based on facts. And do you believe that your analysis is objective? Yes. Uh, is it based upon political strategy or is it based upon an actual analysis of whether the properties will sell or not? It's based on um, an analysis of what's happened with properties in other cities and with our knowledge of the properties here. In other words, is, is I'll ask it again, but in a slightly different way. Is your analysis based upon political strategy or is it based upon something else? No, it's based on something else. And it actually, I mean, in, in the paragraph you're talking about, it actually talks about, you know, two scenarios, one where properties do sell and what that would mean and one where they don't. Okay. Any questions? Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. I just would like you to comment on the uh, fundamental issue that, that what you're pushing for is a is a one percent sales tax uh, additional to this to what will be a seven percent sales tax um, it is my strong belief that when uh, this city has a disparate tax as compared to the region uh, it makes our economy shrink and not grow and people who can make purchase decisions uh, uh, that have a 2% difference, especially for high ticket items, are going to make decisions to purchase things outside of the city rather than inside the city. The sales tax is, is now going to 6% in the surrounding counties, and uh, you're advocating for an 8% sales tax in the city of Philadelphia, and I'd just like you to comment on uh, how much, if the, if the administration has done any analysis on the uh, impact to our GDP and the local economy as a consequence of having a 2% difference between uh, the surrounding county sales tax and Philadelphia sales tax. Right. Um, so, I mean, what, I think the, the short answer is no, we haven't done a full analysis. We did look at what happened to our sales tax receipts when the increase was enacted, because I mean, it was enacted five years ago, um, and we really didn't see much impact, so we didn't look at it and think, okay, there was a heavy negative impact from it. Uh, you know, that said, you know, there are trade-offs. You never really want to increase or extend the tax, but we think kind of given the options we have here, that's a better option than not having you know, stable recurring revenues for the district. Has the administration uh, given up, or are you still actively lobbying for the cigarette tax in Harrisburg, and what are its prospects? So we plan to continue to, to advocate and lobby for that. Um, we do think that that is a really hard push in Harrisburg. What's the rash? Why is that a hard Explain why that's a hard push. So in the spring, we pushed hard for cigarette tax. Uh, I think towards the end of the process, um, Grover Norquist sent a memo to Republicans saying if you increase this, you will have broken your tax pledge. Um, we saw a support, whatever support there was, evaporate really quickly. Um, and we don't, we haven't heard anything that changes where the House is. And that's really where we think our problem is with House Republicans. Uh, okay. Thank you. Sure. We know for the record, Councilman Keenan is also present. Uh, in terms of questioning, Councilman Sanchez and Councilman O'Neill. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Um, notwithstanding the debate around the sales tax, uh, what is the administration's thought uh, if, in fact, cigarettes or no relief comes from Harrisburg? Understanding that Dr. Height made it very clear that 50 open schools, 50 does not close schools. What is plan B if nothing comes from Harrisburg? Well, something has come from Harrisburg. They enacted the sales tax. Right. If we enact it locally. Outside, and I, that's why I said outside of the sales tax. I don't want to debate the sales tax. You know how strongly I can go on the record well, on the, how strongly I feel about that. Yeah, I mean, that is our plan B if nothing comes from Harrisburg is the sales tax. So what is your plan C in light of the fact there, there has been a reluctance on council to accept the sales tax because of all the um, reasons stipulated by Councilman Green. And I would go further in the fact that um, there is a debate in Harrisburg about moving all of um, school funding to sales tax um, and eliminating the exemptions that makes the tax less regressive. Um, so if, in fact, we get no cigarette, sales tax is not passed, what is the administration's thought then? I don't think there's another recurring source of revenue that we could get to the district that would replace, either, you know, if we don't get either the cigarette tax or the sales tax. I think then the district is, is facing diminished, you know, a lower level of revenues than they get if either one of those things come through. And then you have a district that I don't think provides the kind of you know, education that we need it to. If, in fact, um, this property sale piece goes through, and, and I agree with you, we want to make sure that we get to the $78 million so that we don't impact the school district's plan, and I think we can, and I think you'll hear witnesses um, um, after you that will speak to that. Is the administration prepared to put any additional money from our general fund surplus um, to the school district? Well, in our five-year plan, mm -hmm. you know, our low point is $8 million. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things that we think might make that turn out a little better, but it's still a narrow fund balance, and it, to the extent that we put in any recurring monies from our general fund, we'll be facing deficits on the general fund side, and we'll have to, you know, then we have to figure out how to cut those, and we're not proposing that at this time. If, in fact, we ended up in a situation, you know, and I think uh, my colleague, Councilwoman Blackwell, spoke to this during Council, we have done a very poor job um, in what we've asked the district to do in terms of opening up schools, which I believe in many cases are unsafe, understaffed. I went to several um, parent nights where um, saw the level of frustration with, with parents. Um, if we have to do more money, is the administration going to be willing to put more money on the table? I mean, the beauty of our budget cycles is every year we get to do a new budget your plan. Is the administration um, prepared to do additional allocation to the district in light of the fact that we all know we're in a very precarious situation at the district right now? Well, I guess where we are is this is a plan that doesn't affect our general fund and doesn't hurt the school district's finances. We think that's really preferable. We're not proposing to do something that hurts our general fund. Your general fund, where, where, where this year, where is our general fund? Well, our general fund will end this year well over $200 million, but that's why we do a five-year plan, and the plan shows that fund balance going down, you know, in part as you know, we fund firefighters award, we have money in there for other, you know, for other new costs, but that's why you do a five-year plan, so that you see what things look like in the future. So it's the position of the administration right now that um, outside of what we're debating here to today, there's no plans in the future, whether plan A or plan B, if plan A and plan B don't work. We don't future. have a, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Neal. Yes, Mr. DeBeau. Um, I believe that the administration's acceptance to begin with in Harrisburg of the plan as the budget was being passed is the fatal flaw here that we're still dealing with. They would have not left Harrisburg without that agreement. They would have found a way to fund a state school system with state dollars for the portion that the district and the SRC, appointed by the state by majority, 
had set up in the funding scheme. City portion, union portion, state portion. It is unheard of. I don't think there's an example that's ever occurred in the United States where a state responsibility for a state system passed an extension of a local tax to fill in their portion of responsib responsible funding. Our position is the most rational possible. If we are going to again extend that tax as we did for the extraordinary reason we did in the first place, recognizing the lack of competitive uh, advantage or the competitive advantage we give to our competitors in the surrounding counties, it's going to be for an overwhelming problem that we can't see another solution to, like pension liability. The state isn't going to help us with our pension liability. They have enough problems of their own, but they take care of state funding issues. I don't think in the history of this country a state has ever passed or extended a local tax to cover a state expenditure. I dare somebody to bring an example of it forward. And this one, rare first time exception, they can actually turn to anyone that questions it and say, yeah, but the city agreed to it. It's totally different once you get to that point because they're exonerated. They had the city, as far as they were concerned, agreement. The fact that council wasn't involved that's internal here, because we disagree. But it's no different, and it may seem like too simple an analogy, it's actually a very apt analogy, that if the federal government were to do the same thing to any state in the union for a federal expense that they didn't feel like funding anymore, or to the level they agreed was needed, and they passed an override in that state tax that was authorized by the federal government to cover the, the – any state would react the same way. If we pass <coughs> what our administration and our city has agreed to that way, we are just becoming part of the okay. It's not the question of how do we fill in the rest of the money. The question is, how does the state fill in the rest of the money? Because that's their responsibility. Act 46, if I'm correct, when the state took over the system, they were so worried that we would reduce our commitment that we had the maintenance of effort and with really strong language that we can't even go, it's, it's extremely tight. It's not even as flexible as it should have been. Time and time again in the last few years, we've been asked, to uh, not just maintain effort, but increase effort where the state hasn't been. And this year, where we're being asked again, we do our share. And if this, this uh, tobacco tax isn't authorized, we'll do our share for our share. We'll find a way to do it. But us, the city, doing the state share is just, I mean, it's, it's the antithesis of any intergovernmental relations that could possibly exist in this country between federal and state or state and local. And we, us, we being a city and county, being the economic engine of the state, who also has the, the highest poverty um, rate in, in the state and is a giver rather than a receiver in spite of that poverty level, uh, the, the fundamental problem is the state's got to get the message that the city thought they agreed but don't agree to paying their share the state share, because that's what we're doing. We want to pay our share. We'd like the tobacco tax to do it because it would even be more than our share and it would be a funding stream. And hopefully eventually that'll pass. But to have us be paying the state share and even having a conversation of if we don't have the sales tax to pay the state share, how do we pay the state share? We shouldn't be having. The state should know that we're not going to do it. It's their responsibility. Whenever they come back to do the transportation bill, which they should have stayed in Harrisburg and done and might have if they had to stay in to do the school funding, uh, maybe we'll get things like the tobacco bill, but we'll also get the, the funding that realistically we're not going to pay for. They're not going to pay for our pension problems or any other extraordinary problem we have. 
we're not going to pay for what in their, the scope of their fund, their budget is a minor issue. Whatever the politics are, it's not important. It's a state responsibility and not a city responsibility. We didn't take the school system off of them. They took it off of us and even put in requirements to make sure we kept our funding and we've gone even beyond what we were required to do. I just want that message to be out there because I do not see us doing any more except confusing people that the city agreed to this when the city is more than just the administration. And um, uh, there was no partnership here. It's similar to what's in front of me here to vote on. You may be right that there's not 50 million in here. I don't know. The only thing I know is the administration's at one end of this on opposition. Council's president and, and council are in the other side at 50. I don't have a negotiated agreement on some middle ground. I got to take one or the other. It's an easy vote for me to take the council president's position. Because if he's wrong, he's wrong by a certain amount that we may have wound up agreeing on if we were working together on this and not digging our heels in at one end and, and the other. So I'm voting for it. But I think now that it got brought up on the record, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up on the record that we made a huge mistake. It's a correctable, correctable mistake because that commitment was contingent. Uh, whoever didn't know the council had to pass that uh, or believed that council had agreed to it already uh, can easily be told, sorry, thought we, we could get that through and we can't. And, and go back to the state paying for the state's responsibility. So, so a couple of things. Okay. Um, we were not involved in any discussions, to make this clear, uh, with the state on extending the stale tax. We learned about it. this when they it. announced it publicly. So they, they did this without us. It wasn't, That's even better. Yeah, I just, want to, I just want to make that clear. Right. Um, well, why? But well, can I, can I finish? I no, I'm going to stop you there because this is a valid interruption. If you bring something up that explains further what has been reported in the paper and is the administration's position, that they support that, that they were not involved in agreeing to. If you, if you say that, the administration has agreed to it. They were agreeing to it in Harrisburg after the deal was done. They didn't say, we'll get back to you after we talk to the council president and council president talks to council members and gets back to us. Once you do that, you've agreed on behalf of the city and you don't have the authority to do that, but you did. And that is a big difference. Whether you were in the original deal, it may be worse if you do it afterwards, and you could have easily said, I wasn't part of it, we weren't part of this, we'll check back with you and see if that's the kind of legislation we can get approved. Because the answer would have been fast and furious from uh, the council president that um, nobody was on deck, let alone a majority. So, Mr. Devo, can, I, can I finish my response to... Before you respond, can you put it in the context, at the beginning of your testimony, you said there are things that the mayor and council agree upon. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so why aren't we proceeding together based upon what we agree upon? Go ahead. Uh, so me just, so I said, we're not involved. Once the deal was announced, and deal is actually not the right word, once the plan was announced um, and we became convinced that um, it was going to be a re it was unlikely to get the cigarette tax done time to help the district this year. Um, we advocated for implementing this tax. You agreed for us to pay the state share, is what you agreed to. This is what we're we didn't. Uh, this is what we're advocating to have happen. I think the council president's plan um, calls for a split, right? So it still has a sales tax extension. I can so be really for, the question is I can how much of that extension goes it. to the district and how much goes to the pensions. I That's can be for where we differ. that rather than what's out there now, only because the alternative is what the administration is promoting, which is the entire last percent. Uh, because 70 million is better than nothing. And all the other money you're talking about is But not nothing. 
Now, before that, we're paying the state share. No, no you're, you're saying nothing for pensions. It's not nothing for pensions, oh. right? It's over 10 years, $400 million for pensions. That's and how much is the council president's nothing. plan over 10 years? Over 10 years, it'd probably be 700. Thank you. So it's more. Okay, so but it's a compromise it's on our part nothing. if we do that. But it says two things. One, we don't re we agree to it. Not the state telling us that that's the plan, and we just better send you know send it back with a with a stamp on it. Secondly, is we're doing it as a compromise. We don't agree with it, but we know the compromise works better, and we'll. We'll do it. I mean, I never would tell you I would be for this, except we're in this box that we've been put in with this 1%. And if the council president's plan gets us $700 million and right off the bat uh, for the 10 years, that's not $300. That's $300 million. That's significant to me uh, as a compromise. And if we were to get the whole thing, how much would it be, which is all our money? If we were to get all of the, so it would probably be, you know, twice the 700 million. 1.4 billion. Yeah, so 700 million of it, we're still paying the state share. Right, but that's okay. not that's right. going to happen. I mean, that, it's just not going to happen up there. So, I mean, we can argue about it down here, but that's not what's going to happen up there. We're not going to get all the sales tax going to pensions. Okay. We're, okay. That's fine. Mr. Bo, I, I laid out a context, and the context was... Uh, in the beginning of your testimony, you said there are things that we agree upon. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we proceeding based upon what we agree upon as opposed to what the administration agrees with Harrisburg on? That's a simple question from council. Right. And I think we've had, I think we'd be actually happy to work with council. I think kind of the difference in where we are is we would like that advocacy to happen after passing 1% down here to ensure that the district gets funding, and I think council would like the advocacy to happen before. But you do believe that a majority of council will approve some sales tax extension? I do believe that. And you do believe that it will cover $50 million? I do believe that that will happen at some point, too. Then why are we not proceeding together? I'd be happy to proceed together. Okay. Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, uh, I could not agree more with everything uh, Councilman O'Neill had to say about uh, the uniqueness of uh, what the state has presented to the city. And in your testimony, you said that you did not agree to it or the administration did not agree to it in advance. Uh, for the record, who agreed to it in advance? Was it our legislative delegation? I don't believe they agreed to it either. I think this was a proposal that the governor's office put together. I don't think that there were Philadelphians who agreed to it. But I'm, and as far as I know, we weren't involved in any discussions, so. Weren't there Philadelphians who voted for it? I don't know. I, I don't know that. Yes. Uh, just, I'd like to clarify something on the <coughs> uh, legislation itself uh, and hopefully get your agreement on, on section two. Um, uh, I think you either said explicitly in your testimony or you implied uh, that there are ongoing uh, revenue uh, from sales of schools that are in the district's budget uh, for this year and also that will be the case in future years. Uh, and so I just wanted to say and get your agreement hopefully for the record that if you read section two, it does not state the terms of the agreement that is required between paid, the school district, and the city. Therefore, uh, if the city were to receive more than the $50 million we are putting up for the schools today, it could, in that agreement with the school district, agree that the school district will receive all proceeds in excess of the $50 million that pays us back such that uh, in terms of their planning, they will not be disadvantaged by this move. And in fact, for the current year, instead of getting $28 million for sales, they'll get uh, $50 million. I think we actually say that in the testimony, that if, um, if the sales generate 
you know, more than the 50 or more than 78, that the district would, would be fine, that the issue is if it doesn't generate more than 50. And that's when the, the school district in the city could be at risk. But, but you agree that the, the legislation as written would permit that to be in the agreement between yes. the city paid and... Yes. Thank you. Yes, we um, were reviewing this map, but I agree with all that has been said. Uh, Councilman O'Neill and all my colleagues who have talked about this whole issue, and Council has tried its best to work out something with the administration. We even have hearings coming up on the 20th to talk about this whole state issue and how it affects us in Council. I mean, it's not till November 20th. And, uh, I don't know that we understand why we can't move beyond this, because we're all on the same page. And uh, we're trying to understand why we can't get the administration to come up with something uh, to find some kind of agreement, uh, because we all feel the same way. And we feel stuck because the administration doesn't seem to want to find a way to work with us to get past this point. Well, I think we'd be, as I said, we'd be happy to, to work with Council. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. First and for the record, we are not Washington, D.C. We're going to figure a way uh, to work this out on behalf of the kids. Um, and I have a couple of questions um, that uh, in your five-year plan, I think your biggest concern is the fund balance going over the five-year plan, is that right? That's correct. In your five-year plan, hmm? you assume that after the two years of uh, wage tax reductions, that we will continue that on in your plan. We do. Well, where do you make that assumption that we are, as a body, going to continue down that path if we have <clears throat> such a pressing need for a fund balance, a pressing need for operating uh, uh, budget and a pressing need for the school board that we would continue down that path. And if so, we, that's $27 million in FY15, $52 million in FY16, $100 million in FY17, and another $185 million uh, in uh, FY18. If, if we have, what, why isn't that on the table for discussion that we would not continue on in that path, which would alleviate your main concern about the sale or proposed sale of the real estate as opposed to other options, that if we slowed down on that, we pretty much we would be, and I'm not a CPA or, or, or the budget director, but I mean, isn't that at least being discussed? Yeah, that doesn't, though, I mean, the district's problem isn't just the $50 million. I know we talk a lot about the, the first year, but their problem is really the recurring revenue. And, you know, without enactment of legislation to help them over the long run, they're really facing a problem that's well over $100 million a year. But real money. So our wage tax reductions wouldn't pay for that. Well, $27 million is real money, $52 million is serious money, $100 million uh, begins to address the problem, and, and $185 million puts us, uh, I think, close to being in the black. Right, but it doesn't compensate for $530 million that the district would get through sales tax extension through that same time period. But I, I understand that remedy, but, but it, getting past the rough patch in the road, this, the suspension of the wage tax reduction might well help us along that, and delaying that in a way would solve some of the day-to-day -day problems we face right here, right now. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, I hear you, and it doesn't solve the district's problem, and it stops, you know, the, the program right after we started it again, which again then, I mean, the reason for the wage tax reduction plan is, you know, to send a signal to the business community that we're trying to lower their costs. If you know, one year after we reinstate it, 
we pass new legislation that stops it, that sends the opposite signal. Okay, and what signal, if we don't address this, does it send to our, our young people if we don't deal with the situation when we know we have the capacity and the means to do so? Uh, the other thing is... Well, we do think we should address it. I mean, we have a proposal to okay, address that's it. That's one, and we have another. The, that's right. The, the, the other one that we have is that we, based on AVI appraisals, believe that that real estate is worth a collective of uh, $300 million. And you say, or people have said from the administration, that that is a rosy colored perspective on real estate. Is that accurate? Well, I think that appraisal is looking at them kind of in, as school buildings. I don't think it's looked at them as what their value is if they were redeveloped. I think that's a different question. And I think what you've seen in other cities, and I think with sales here before too, is that when um, lo localities sell school buildings, they don't get what their appraised value was. Well, when AVI, and I've sat through as my colleagues have, hours and hours and hours at nauseum, mm -hmm. listening to the accuracy of AVI and how trailblazing it is and setting us straight by way of our real estate values, why does it not apply to the school system if there is the same system? They knew what the use of the buildings and properties were. And, and contrary to e even almost validating their system, we've already received over $100 million in real offers on real real estate. I think the problem we have is in part that the SRC and the uh, uh, school board isn't the school administration isn't in the real estate business. They don't do this d during the day. They deal with maintenance of properties, they deal with erection of properties, but they do not deal with disposition of properties. Evidenced by, in my district, uh, we've had uh, Bieber Annex for sale for 15 years. And what the, uh, the council's proposal is to do is move it into the professionals' hands that do this for a living. And I, I think it is, I, I think it is just, it, 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 I don't, I, I want to use the right adjective. It just doesn't make sense to me um, that we don't move on this if we have real money on the table uh, from real people that want to use the property. Uh, and, uh, and how do we do that? Give me a second. Well, we have, I mean, the professionals who would be working with them are already working with them. There are people from the administration, Patty are already working with the district. So that won't change as a result of anything we do with this so, legislation. So you're saying to me that, that, that that's already happening. And one other thing, I mean, to the extent that there are people who have come forward with proposals, we would love to see so them. So where, where is the breakdown in communication between the real offer on the table and the real uh, seller's uh, uh, assessment of whether that is a real and viable option? We have two properties for 25 to 35 million right now. Why, can we make a commitment to evaluate those uh, letters of intent? Yeah, I mean, we would love to see any letters you have, and we would seriously evaluate any of them. So, so when you say seriously evaluate, that we can set a time that we will, I mean, it doesn't take long to see if a deal is real. Either, I mean, you, you know, some lending institutions can do it almost instantaneously. Either the proposed seller meets the credit requirements and of uh, substantial uh, assets. What, can we get a time frame? Because June is still a coming. And, and those kids are operating um, as chair of public safety in unsafe environments. You got principals down in lunchrooms uh, be becoming NTAs. You have counselors that are doing double duty uh, to, to, to provide a safe environment. We can do better. And, and so the clock is running, the meter is moving. What time frame can you, if we, if we can get the real offers before you, how long will it take for you to evaluate their viability? Alan Greenberger, um, we'd love to see the list, first of all. It may overlap with the list that we also have already. We worked with the school district over the summer to change some of their policies on disposition that would enable us to put properties for which there is significant and serious uh, buying interest out on the street quickly assess what kind of level of interest is out there and to the extent that it is one credible buyer, 
um, do a negotiation on a sale so that we can get the school district, excuse me, <clears throat> the money for those properties as quickly as possible. And we, those RFQs for several of the properties are teed up and ready to go. When you say quickly as possible, what does that actually mean? We've, I remember um, when it came to uh, yeah. uh, 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 education with all deliberate speed, what, what does that mean? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it means. The, the, policy, the policy now states from the school district that um, we would put out RFQs for a select number of properties for which there has been significant interest expressed from credible buyers. We would do that, <clears throat> excuse me, over a 30-day period, take letters of interest if there was a single credible buyer um, and, and a responsible reuse, um, we would then start a negotiation with that buyer, help the school district do a negotiation with that buyer. You'd have to get appraisals. We would get them. They would get their own appraisals, and you would do a real estate transaction and move that property. All right, so give me a date that we can, if we put a letter or buyer on the table, how long reasonably? would it take for you to evaluate the, vi the, the, the viable nature of that? Call? I think we'd want if it, if to, if it's one that we don't already know about, um, we'd want to bring them in, meet with them, right, assure that they're credible, but then yeah, it, would counsel, so it would take a couple counsel, of weeks. Good. Counsel, let, me, let me try to be helpful. Yeah, sure. Am I not is, hearing is, the question right? No, no, this is the problem. Go ahead. You keep talking about your process. We don't care about your process. We don't care about the RFQ you're talking about putting out. We don't care about what you want to do in terms of interviewing people. What council is saying is, we have an offer. Do something with it. You should respond differently than you've responded before. Do you hear me now? Um, we're happy to take the list and work with it. Not, not a list. Specific offers. If there's a specific offer. We're happy to take the offer and work with it. That's the so, right answer. So can, can you, well, let me, all right, uh, listen, on this side of the table, we're the politicians. On that side of the table, you're the straight guys that, to, you know, give us the straight answer. Give me a reasonable time frame, a week, 30 days, what, what are we talking about? I think to establish the ability to put out, to, to put that out is a couple of weeks for us. We'd like to meet with the so person that's... So if I were generous and say 30 days, that's reasonable? Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Blackwell. I certainly agree with what my colleagues... Uh, have just said we have people the, 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 we heard earlier the first reported reuse was for schools second was for community interest project and third was for other things well I have people who ask for all three for the same properties I have other schools who are saying that they want to buy the schools we have, we have people who come to us who operate schools, who want to expand their schools and close buildings, and we're still stuck. We can't seem to get everybody to, we need money for schools to operate. Everybody says there's a financial need, but we can't get anything done. And that is the frustration of it all. You visit students, you talk to principals, you go to meetings, you go to open house, you deal with promise schools and you hear about rep repurposed schools, but nothing is happening to move us from point A to point B, and all we do is spend our time spinning our wheels because we can't get any sense out of, out of how we move forward. We have a plan to move forward, but uh, you know, uh, in addition to all the private institutions, as you know, I represent more institutions than anybody. I got the institutions, but I have schools within those institutions and other people who want to buy, and yet we're still stuck. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, no. Good question. <laughs> Mr. President, <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, and I promised the councilman I'd stay out of the room, but I'm like a little kid, right? I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I had to come in. I, I, I just want to first, first of all, um, thank you all for you know testifying today, and I want to thank the committee for doing great. I like, I like the, what I'm hearing. I just want to go through something quickly, and then go start with the statement that I've been making for a while. 
and it's about this whole notion of every time there's a fiscal issue, the first response is to stick your hands in the taxpayer's pocket, right? And I've been pretty consistent about that. So I think whenever there's an opportunity to not do that and to bring needed revenue to the table for the institution, the district, or whatever it so be, the department, then we should need to investigate that. In this particular case, it's clear based on the fact that since we submitted a proposal to sell properties, all of a sudden you realize that there's actually worth. And you actually can do this, right? I hear you today talk about accelerating a process that will allow you. The fact of the matter is, a month ago, you passed an SRC resolution that allowed you to circumvent every imaginable disposition problem. And, and I'm saying this to you, you're not in the SRC, but you know, you got members on the SRC, so it's all the same thing from our perspective. So this notion that we should go out and borrow money, i.e. stick our hands in the taxpayer's pocket, as opposed to doing something a little creative that actually gave you an opportunity to raise revenue and to take blighted properties out of the, the neighborhoods, and actually, guess what? You're actually gonna produce long-term revenue I'm sure you saw the proposal that was submitted earlier that actually talks about the revenue generated by repurposed schools. So this notion about that first response, sticking your hands in the taxpayer's pocket, it's getting old. It keeps getting old. Um, I am, as you know, I'm assuming you know, that we are talking to the school district. Just got off the phone with Dr. Height. Uh, not only is there a potential of this proposal providing much needed revenue um, for the school district, um, in a very urgent way, since there was this sense of urgency expressed earlier about we need 50 million right away, um, just like they needed 45 million right away. And I'm starting to get a little concerned about, you know, and I, I know this should be targeted towards the school district, their sense of selective urgency. Because uh, I don't know where they are on this, and they need to be on board with this if it's such an urgency. So I just want to say that I want to thank council members for supporting this effort. Uh, working together, pulling together, because these schools lie in all council members' district. They remain committed. Um, and there are, and there currently is a process, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the possibility of dis disposing of all of the inventory. And I know I'll be asked this question later at this point. I can't talk to you about it, but I'm sure you know about it. Uh, that would bring over $100 million to the table for school districts. So this whole notion that we have to have to go out and spend taxpayers' dollars for every fiscal challenge is always of concern to me. Um, I don't, Councilman, I understand you got into this issue about the um, challenges associated with the five-year plan, I think, with that reference today? Yes. And you do understand, I'm assuming that that came out about the tax We had reduction a discussion about that. That was not voted on or passed by this council, being we, in a five-year plan? We talked about that. Okay. All right. Good. All right, sir. Mr. Chair, thank you so much, sir. I will go back in my room. I will not come back out. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any questions for this witness? Thank you. Alan Dom. Good afternoon, Mr. Dom. Good afternoon, Councilman Good. Uh, before you proceed with your testimony, I have a quick question. Uh, does your organization, GPAR, give money to elected officials? Give what? Does your organization, GPAR, give money to elected officials? Elected officials? Yes. I think through our state uh, PAC, they do, absolutely. You have a PAC? State does, yes. And it gives money to elected officials? Yes. Are you involved in that process? Not me personally. Who's involved in the process locally? Probably the, or the RPAC chairperson. And do you, know how, do you know how the decisions are made? I don't know offhand. Do you know why money is given? Do I know why money is given? Probably supporting property rights and good things for the city. You don't know specifically why? No. Okay, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. So actually, uh, I think last Thursday, I received a list of the 24 schools that were closing. And before I get to this, though, I want to just mention something. City Council said you have an offer on the table, possibly, for one or two schools. From the private sector, if we had an offer for one or two schools, and I'm guessing it might be University City and Charles Drew, 
because those schools are very valuable schools sandwiched in between Drexel and Penn. As an individual, we would order a professional appraisal from two firms immediately, which probably takes two to four weeks, and get an exact value and try to get the best possible price from either those two institutions or whoever else might be interested. But those two schools are very valuable. Having said that, this past Saturday and Sunday, I took the time and traveled to all 24 schools myself. I went to every school that's been closed, walked around every school, studied the neighborhood to try to understand what the issues are. We put together a map, which I think we made available to you, that basically shows four different levels. It shows repurposed schools that were already done. It shows tier one schools that I understand have a level of interest from buyers. It shows tier two schools, which are in green, which we think have value, residentially or in other purposes. And it shows tier three schools, which we don't believe have any value. And I'll, I'll discuss each one in, in briefly. But the first step would be that we suggest an appraisal is done for all these schools on a professional basis, and I'll tell you why. The OPA records, which we received from Council President Clark's office, are inaccurate as examples. I drove by Stephen Douglas School in between Fishtown and Port Richmond. It says it's 49,000 square feet according to OPA. It's actually 120,000 square feet. William Penn, according to OPA, says there's 281,000. It's about 450,000 square feet. And I can go through more and more examples of inaccuracies in the, uh, in the square footages of these buildings. People buying real estate, by the way, will look at the square footages of these properties. Having said that, the first tier schools, Stephen Douglas, Abigail Vare, Joseph Letty, Charles Jewell University City, well, Alexander Wilson, uh, here's an example, next to Misher College. They just built a brand new building on Woodland Avenue. Tremendous value. Misher College is probably going to be the buyer of that school. William Penn is probably Temple University is the buyer of that school. Anna Shaw in 5401 Warrington Avenue. I didn't think that area was so great, and I'm, I'm not an expert in these areas, but I did drive the area in the neighborhood, and I understand there's a buyer. I would sell it to that buyer, because that school, I think, is a tough sale. Stephen Douglas, very good school in Fishtown, excellent for residential. Abigail Vare on Moya Mensing Avenue, across from a great park, great value there. And so is the Belmont Avenue Joseph Letty School. The second tier schools, as an example, Charles Carroll, Potential in Port Richmond to do townhouses there? Absolutely, very valuable. Communications technology and 81st Street and George Pepper, two huge schools which huge land and across is Corman that has tons of residential middle class apartments. And I think you could have a buyer for that from that commercial, uh, uh, commercial development. John Reynolds and Robert Vaux, those schools, the only shot there is if maybe Gerard College wants to expand, but those are tough schools to sell. And I think that would be a problem. Edward Bach, I think, has a possibility for residential development. Same thing with Walter Smith and Joseph Ferguson. Ferguson, I think Temple could be your buyer, expanding east. Third tier schools, these are the most challenging. John Whittier, and it's on your chart there in blue. Leslie Hill on Ridge Avenue, West Clearfields, John Whittier, Anna Pratt's North 22nd, Robert Fulton, East Haines Street, Germantown. By the way, OPA says the Germantown High School is worth $10 million. I'm not sure it's worth anywhere close to that number. So I think there are some schools that are worth a lot more and some that are worth way less. Uh, John Kinsey, Fairhill. I went to Fairhill on Sunday, and Sunday was, uh, I think it was a Puerto Rican Day parade. And it was interesting. I mean, I walked around that block, and I see what's going on. And if we don't do something with these schools quickly, there's going to be issues, I think, by the way. Even the Sheridan West is a problem. But you know, these schools have a common thread. They have little to no value in their present condition. And I'm not sure there are potential to put new housing there. A big picture, which is a crazy idea, I'll just throw it out there, because I like to throw out crazy ideas is to maybe say, you know what, the real problem in these areas, and on the chart, most of these areas are in the northern section of the city, all the blues on this chart. The real problem is employment in these areas, jobs. That's the problem. It's not housing, it's jobs. So maybe, you know, the city has unique tools at its disposal. Maybe you could make these KOZ zones, maybe create more tax benefits for companies to locate here, make it so that employment 
occurs in these areas. Make so a company locates a technology place there, give them all the taxes abated they want with one requirement. 10% of their employees within a 10 block radius have to be employed in that company. Because what's needed in these areas is employment, desperately. I mean, I do not usually go to these locations, and I took the time to do it on this past Sunday. To me, it was an eye-opener. And I gotta tell you that without employment, we're never gonna change these areas. And we, having said that, I think there's more value here than $50 million. There might be more value here than $100 million at the end of the day in these schools. But I think they have to be apportioned properly. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't sell our really valuable schools for too small of a price. So that's why we're suggesting GPAR to do professional appraisals and really get the numbers down. That's basically my testimony. I um, want to thank Council President Clark for asking us to come in and, and chair Councilman Good and the other councilmen. And if any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Questions for witness? Councilman Jones. Thank you for your testimony. And you answered one of the questions by aggregating the underestimated properties and the overestimated properties. And you came up with a figure for the record approximation. What was it again? Well, there's several properties where square footages from OPA are grossly inaccurate. Grossly inaccurate. So I mean, for the total portfolio, which your guesstimate is worth? I think, on my limited knowledge, I think you're at least at 100 million or more of potential value. But I think the bigger picture here is that we can take the lemons that we have, these tier three properties, and make lemonade out of them and create these. This is an opportunity to change these neighborhoods. Huge opportunity. To your point. Uh, there was, when we did the presentation in council about the real estate, we examined some of the reuses of old schools that are now repurposed. And one of them is in my district at 57th and Haverford, where 50 seniors actually live in that facility. So yeah, maybe in a pure market sense, it was not valuable, but to a developer that understood where to get uh, subs subsidized financing for uh, our seniors, it has a value to the 50 people that live there. So even the lower end properties aren't useless. They have a, a, a reuse purpose that may not uh, wind up on someone's balance sheet uh, in a positive way, but by way of those people that live there, it, it's priceless. So just the point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions for this witness? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next witness is Victor Pinkney, Gerald Zaslow. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Good, members of the committee. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for giving us the time to speak. And to Mr. Dom, I'd like to say, you know, that brilliant minds think a lot like a lot of things he addressed, but some of the things I'm going to address maybe in a, a lot broader term. Uh, first of all, this bill is a great idea. There's no downside to the city giving the school district $50 million for vacant buildings versus the school, bill, school district borrowing the sum. The budget, their budget is already in the red. To have them take on additional uh, expense via interest payments with no, revenue, with no new revenue sources available when they say something of value to sell, when they have something of value to sell is ludicrous. Plus the fact that these buildings are vacant will eventually add, neighbor, add to neighborhood blight. It will cause the school district or the city additional expenses for security to guard against vandalism, in and out carpet, and metal theft. Why deal with the possibility when they can be utilized for senior housing, subsidized housing, and market rate housing? Not to mention various charter schools are looking to acquire buildings. For example, Arise Academy, a charter, a charter school that focuses on children from Foster Homes is looking for, to acquire a new home. Buildings could be given to community groups to develop with block grant money for community use. If the rehab is done using, using union labor, students who have an interest in building trades, such as those in the program at Overbrook High School, can, be, can, can do an apprenticeship in whatever trade that they, that they qualify for. The city already has in place government and quasi-government agencies to deal, deal with the selling, marketing, and developing of such large-scale projects that these buildings would require. As I previously said, to leave them sitting 
will, cause, will only add to neighborhood bright, blight and cause problems. Bill 130577 will remove that possibility, provide opportunity for a positive outcome for the neighborhoods, as well provide additional revenue for the school district without increasing their debt. Thank you, Councilman Good and members of the committee for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Darrell Zaslow, I am legal counsel to HAPCO, the Homeowners Association of Philadelphia. As you heard Mr. Pinckney say, we are here in support of this bill. We do understand the administration's concerns over the buildings and the need for, for providing the money from some source. But as owners of real estate in this city, we see the value of real estate. Every one of these buildings used to have a good community purpose. You've heard very clear testimony. Some of them have real commercial value. And even the ones which have no value, these are buildings and communities where people live. And if they need to be repurposed, recreated to some other use in that area, then that's what needs to be done. From our perspective, it is a matter of good government as to who should do the job. Everyone agrees, take the schools, sell the schools, repurpose the schools. From our perspective, it is the city which should be doing this, not the school district, which should be focusing on education and students in classrooms. Councilman Jones, I think you said it point blank. You have experts here. That's what their day job is. Why should school district officials be contemplating how to use a school? The city, the city council specifically, you know our neighborhoods, and your sense of how to reuse these schools is going to make a lot more sense in a larger picture than something that the school district officials, looking from their perspective only at the dollar bottom line, is going to make. If we're getting something of value for the 50 million that you're deciding must be given, that's even better. Why go out and borrow money and end up with nothing if you can get the 50 million over to the school district and something is owned by it? I do want to offer a note of concern, actually two concerns. The first one is regarding the OPA values of these properties. It's amazing to sit here and hear professionals such as the city administration warning you that these properties are all over assessed, that all the cities around the country, you go to sell a real estate, a piece of real estate, and they never get what they think it's worth. And then you have super qualified professionals who deal with real estate every minute of every day who say some of these properties have greater value than what they've been assessed at. The, the uh, OPA's concept of value needs to be looked at very carefully. And again, this is something which the city should be doing and not the school district. And you know what else, Mr. Chairman? Even if the administration is right and your dreams of getting 50 million for the schools never happen, the public doesn't expect you to make this a dollar for dollar proposition. You are managing these properties for the benefit of the city, for the communities, for the neighborhoods. You're going to do the best job that can be done. If it's not the same dollar number that's being proposed, well, then it won't be. And we are not holding you to a sale price that you say is going to be achieved. If it's less money, you did the best you could. We know that you will. If it's more money, terrific. But we believe that it's, it's the art of government as to who should do the process. And you should be doing the process, and it shouldn't be done by the school district. I do have a concern over the language of the bill specifically, and that is in Section 2. As I read Section 2 of the proposed ordinance, it properly says that the transfer of the buildings is only of the money is only to take place if and when the mayor manages to make an agreement. I think that the language is, is a little bit loose. I think that to say that nothing is going to happen here until the mayor effectively enters into an agreement for surplus property is going to leave the administration, from their perspective, with a lot of unanswered questions. If I give one property to the city, that's a surplus property. Does the $50 million go over? Is it 20 properties? Is it all the properties? I think that unless I'm missing something, that the bill should be more specific directing the administration what you expect them to do. Not saying if and when the administration sells or, or transfers surplus property, we transfer the money. It's vague. I think that there's going to be issues over what council really meant in saying it. And I think that you need to say very specifically, here's the 24 schools. We get them all, or whatever your concept is. I don't know exactly what the 
the specifics of it are, but leaving it to the, to the uh, broader language of if the mayor is able to transfer the money and if, if the properties come back, I think it needs to be much more specific. The politics of it is your concern, not ours, but we do have a sense that the administration is not on board with this. We hear it very specifically today. I think that as legal advisors to the administration, if someone's looking to wiggle out of this ordinance the way it's written, I think they may have room to do that by saying, if we do it, well, we didn't do it. And when we do it, well, we didn't do it yet. I think the council may want to consider a very clear directive directing the mayor to transfer the money and to accept the following properties with great specificity. I'd like a final note, if I may, because the date here, October the 3rd, is significant because I'll tell you what property owners across the city are doing at this very moment. They're scrambling around trying to get their appeals of wrong OPA appraisals over to the Board of Re Revision of Taxes. That's what's happening across the city at this moment. I think that the city is leaving a lot of money on the table, and I've tried to convince somebody to at least look at it. Where's the money being left on the table? The OPA, which from our perspective was really largely a failure. I'm not blaming the workers. They're all work doing their best, working hard. The fact of the matter is that 50,000 people thought that their assessment was wrong and followed the entire procedure that they paraded out, and you have to do it by this date, with slick videos on the, on the uh, website, and 50,000 people applied, and 25,000 people, if I understand the numbers, never heard back anything. It's like a black hole of here's my first level review, nothing comes back whatsoever. Now, the failure of the OPA is in that regard, they're overburdened, we understand that. But the administration did something very appropriate, and that is in their budget, they said OPA is going to have a lot of appeals against them. And they're gonna lose a lot of appeals because that's how the system works. And the administration put a very specific number on the amount of money that they are guessing between the first level review at OPA and the real legal appeal, because the OPA thing was a made up concoction of OPA. It does, doesn't exist in the state law. When you get to the BRT for a real appeal, they put a number on a $33 million. Now that's significant because every surrounding county and school. Sanzo, yes, Mr. Chairman. You are for the bill. Excuse me? You are for the bill? We are for the bill. But I don't want to see you leave $33 million. You have four days left to do something. Can I just finish the thought process, Mr. Chairman? For every over-assessment that is appealed and the city says we're going to lose $33 million, already budgeted for, there is the identical number of properties which are under-assessed. And nobody in government unless I'm wrong, is going after the properties that are under-assessed. And as an example, there was, a pro there was a property at 20th and Market. It was all over the newspaper. They sold it for $110 million. And OPA on their website valued it at $88 million. Write the market value that the market bears, and we see $22 million error, which translates into almost $300,000 lost taxes to the city on one property. So there's four days left. Property owners are scrambling to deal with over-assessments. I think the city needs to be dealing with the under-assessments, and you have four days left to do it in order to bring back into the city the money that's being lost. Now, if, that's, if, if the Supreme Court decision that allowed OPA and created the, high, the hybrid of the OPA and the BRT somehow says the city can't appeal, I would be shocked because every school district and every municipality around us does that. They monitor very carefully where the assessments are too low and go in to try to raise them up. We're not looking to raise property taxes. We're property tax payers. But if the ratio is not right of who's paying what, we think it should be corrected. But yes, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, we are very much in favor of your bill. We thank you, the council president, for uh, giving us a hearing this afternoon. Are you offering testimony? Are you offering testimony? No, I think it's okay. Any questions for this panel related to this bill? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Councilman. Uh, Kevin Gillen. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Chairman, while we're waiting for Mr. Gillen, may I uh, indulge myself for 20 seconds? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I just want to state for the record that uh, the, the city, uh, I believe, that uh, a big portion of the uh, problem with respect to the underassessments has to do with the way we assessed the land portion of buildings in many areas of the city. Uh, I think the city is well aware of that, and some feel, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm among them or not, that it's purposeful uh, that we set a higher rate than we had to this year by uh, uh, having that category be wrong, and that uh, without, quote unquote, raising taxes next year, they will fix that, and lo and behold, the city will collect $50, $100 million more than they collected this year. So we didn't really do a, quote unquote, revenue neutral uh, uh, tax uh, increase. That's what's going on, in my opinion. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Gillen. Uh, before you testify, quick question. Uh, were you here for Mr. Bowe's testimony? Uh, for the latter part of it. Okay. Are you here for the questioning? Am I here for questioning? I said, were you here for the questioning? Uh, um, part of it, yes. Okay. Uh, in your view, is Mr. Bowe's analysis fact or opinion? I, I, I really wouldn't feel comfortable answering that since I really don't feel I have complete information to, to give a thorough and honest answer. You heard the questioning. Well, part of it. I mean, I, admit, I was Bo, also checking my own messages and things like that. You heard Mr. Bo respond that it is opinion based upon fact. Uh, are you offering an analysis today, and is it fact or opinion? I, I am not offering any hard numbers today. Instead, I'm offering some other facts you may want to consider to help make the most informed decision about uh, this financing issue and this legislation. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. It will be very brief. Um, thank you very much for having me this afternoon, and, and thank you to uh, President Clark for inviting me to testify. Um, while there's currently a debate between Council and the Administration uh, over the best way to secure short-term funding for the current and ongoing operations of our city's public schools, uh, it's not my intention today to provide testimony either in favor or against any of the particular options being debated. Uh, rather, I intend to provide some information on the likely costs and benefits of the options being considered. Uh, that is, in particular, the auctioning off and repositioning of several uh, closed school properties to the private market. Uh, we've heard a lot today about what the actual uh, potential sale value of these properties is and what the foregone revenue would be if you kept them idle. Uh, but there are some additional costs and benefits which I think uh, you should take into consideration uh, to make a fully informed decision. Um, while the direct benefits from the sale of these properties may be measured by the offering prices given by the interested parties, the costs of not selling or otherwise redeploying these properties to an alternative use are not zero. Moreover, there are additional indirect benefits from repositioning these properties to an alternative use. Uh, in particular, there are three specific costs to the city and hence the taxpayer of allowing these properties to continue as publicly held vacant structures. They are these three costs are the direct costs, the indirect costs, and the opportunity costs. The direct cost of not repositioning these properties is the cost to the taxpayer of maintaining these properties and continuing to provide public services to them. For example, there are maintenance costs of ensuring these properties do not physically depreciate and fall into disrepair, as well as maintaining the grounds. There are the costs of providing security to these buildings to prevent break-ins or vandalism, and the cost of providing police and fire services in the event that criminal activity or fires occur at these sites. And of course, there is the cost of trash collection to remove any litter or refuse that may be deposited on these sites. All of these services are direct outlays from the city to sites that do not directly generate any tax revenue to offset these costs. Second, the indirect cost of letting these sites remain vacant is the negative spillover effect that they have on nearby property values and their subsequent prevention of the local neighborhood's revitalization. Uh, as my own research on vacant lots and tax delinquent properties in Philadelphia has shown, abandoned properties depress nearby property values and they also signal disinvestment in a neighborhood. This results in both property tax revenues and local housing investment being lower than they otherwise would be, which is also a cost to the city and hence the taxpayer. Third, the opportunity cost of not repositioning these properties is represented by the tax revenue and economic activity that is foregone from not redeveloping these properties to some other use. For example, if a given site were converted to senior housing or a job training center, it would not only begin to generate property tax revenues, but also wage tax revenues from the people who would be employed there. Moreover, the conversion of these sites from vacancy to having an active economic use would also likely have a positive spillover effect on nearby property values, thus increasing both property tax revenues and promoting further neighborhood revitalization. Finally, I should also point out that uh, the current bill 
uh, being sponsored that would significantly curtail Philadelphia's 10-year tax abatement on improvements to real estate would also further hinder efforts to redevelop these former schools to new uses by reducing the return to investing in real estate in Philadelphia. Mr. Gillen, uh, are you an economic development practitioner? I'm an urban economist, and I, I, many of my clients are urban developers. Are you an economic development practitioner? Directly, I am not a developer, no. I work let's, with let's, many let's, developers let's, as part of a team. I've been on development teams. Let's, let's walk through how this actually happens. Uh, you have a property. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone wants to do an economic development project, uh, there's private financing, there's public financing, there's acquisition of land. Uh, put simply, uh, we subsidize projects. Sometimes we take down the interest rate on projects to make it workable by banks. And there's several ways to do that. The easiest way to do that, related to matters contained in this bill, is to simply discount the property uh, for the amount of the abatement, if necessary. Does that make sense to you? I believe you're implying that the abatement offers a lower discount rate and hence a lower cost. I'm not implying cost. anything. I'm, t I'm talking about I'm how economic development deals are done. Yes. In other words, if you're trying to sell someone a property to do a project, to make the project work because we're, we're in the business of subsidy with economic development, you can simply discount the property for the price of the abatement. Does that make sense to you? No, I think of the abatement as a tax break, not a subsidy. I'm not, I'm not asking you what you think of the abatement as. I'm, I'm talking about actual bottom line, how the project works, how the numbers work. Can you provide the subsidy through the discount of the property? I can tell you that in the lenders that I've spoken to, the curtailment of the abatement I'm would result about, in a I'm lower about, return about, and hence higher financing costs for development in Philadelphia. To this bill. What I'm trying to do is get you to focus on this particular bill. Okay. I have one paragraph left to summarize up on, on I understand that, but um, you brought up a different bill. I'm asking you to keep your testimony in the context of this bill and give you an example of how you might apply it. Right. I'm, I'm pointing out the different factors that would affect the likely success of this proposed bill. And the, the legislation that you propose related to the abatement would certainly have an effect there. I'm merely pointing it that out. It would not. I, I would respectfully disagree. You disagree because you're not an economic development practitioner. If, it, if, we're, dealing, if we're only going to sell five properties, I, I, we, we simply discount the five properties for, for the amount and the worth of the abatement. So what you're saying is making sense, but you can continue. In short, while the debate so far may have focused on the direct benefits of selling these school properties, there are additional costs to allowing them to remain vacant and additional indirect benefits from their repositioning to an alternative use. As such, the decisions of whether to pursue this strategy or some other alternative strategy should include a full accounting of all of these costs and benefits in order to make the most informed decision possible. Lastly, the current proposed reduction to the scope of the abatement will also work against the viability of repositioning these properties to new uses. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Let me try this one more time. Uh, let's take a University City high school property. Let's look at it from a viewpoint of an actual offer. Uh, I'm assuming the person who made the actual offer has a project in mind. Let's say they took into consideration what the worth of the abatement on that property was for that property. Either you sell them to, the, to it for this amount with the abatement or you sell it to them for that amount without the abatement. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilor and Green. the price with the abatement would be higher. You determine the price of the property because you're selling it to them. Uh, I, the abatement is capitalized into property values in Philadelphia. The data is pretty clear you, on that. You, 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 you would get a higher a, price for these properties with the abatement. Practitioner. You answered the question right the first time. I, but I, but I, I, try, I try again. You're selling someone a property. You give them one price with the abatement. You give them one price without the abatement. Same bottom line. Does that make sense? Uh, no, I would disagree with that. The, because the abatement would affect the bottom line because it affects the present value you adjust the price of the, the net property, rental scheme. Throw you adjust the price of the property for the worth of the abatement. I'm sorry? You adjust the price of the property for the worth of the abatement, if it's necessary for the project. Whether or not, whether or not it's necessary, whether you, the We're presence of an abatement would still have an effect on prices. I could, I could see an instance so, where you so have you a very high-value property and the so abatement you, may so not be adjust, necessary. So you adjust the price. 
the, the purchaser of the property, the developer, will almost certainly capitalize the value of the abatement into the price they're willing and so to pay. so you discount, if you're not giving the abatement, then you discount the price? Yes. For, for the work of the abatement? Yes. Because we're talking about it in the context of this bill, right? Yes. Okay. Councilman Green. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you guys are in violent agreement. I mean, if the city is, <laughs> if, the, if the city is in control of a property, it mm -hmm. can provide a lower purchase price instead of an abatement as an alternative. The yes, problem is most development in this city is not done through city sold properties. So your general point uh, is, we're, we're, is we're, we're, we're going well, to find a discussion to this bill, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just uh, uh, following your lead. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Gillen. Any other questions for Mr. Gillen? Thank you. Thank you. Walter Spencer. Good afternoon, Chairman Good and Council members. I want to thank Council President Clark for inviting me to testify. My name is Walter Spencer. I've lived in the Rittenhouse Square neighborhood since 1997. Although I'm act an active member of both the Center City Residents Association and the Crosstown Coalition of Taxpayers, the views expressed today are my own. I spent 15 years consulting with state and local governments across the country on AVI projects. I personally worked with New York City, Chicago, Atlanta, and Denver. I also worked in a number of older northeastern cities, including Buffalo, Hartford, and Jersey City. Our firm was often asked to recommend assessments on former public schools that were no longer occupied. We also observed the effect of unoccupied schools on the value of the surrounding properties. Although I have not conducted inspections of the school buildings that are no longer occupied, I am convinced based on review of publicly available information that the city, through a well-managed property disposition program, could realize values exceeding $50 million. And I would second Alan Dom's suggestion that before you expose these properties to the market, you get two qualified appraisals on each property. Several of these properties are, na are in neighborhoods where developers are currently building residential, commercial, and mixed-use projects. These include Abigail Varing, Abigail Vare at 1619 William Ensign, Charles Drew at 11 to 83 North 38th Street, University City at 3601 Filbert Street, Walter Smith at 1300 South 19th Street, and William Penn at 1300 North Broad Street. I believe these five properties taken as a group yield at least $50 million in revenue over a 12- to 24-month period. In a city where large building sites are few and far between, on a number of the schools not listed above are on large lots that create opportunities for new use or supplemental uses in addition to repurch repurposing of the existing structures. The George Pepper Middle School, or George Pepper School, at 2801 South 84th Street is a 37-acre parcel located within a mile of Philadelphia International Airport. There are seven other properties not listed above that are located on sites greater than two acres. I want to talk for a minute about the process. The process that the city follows will affect the values received at closing. Generally speaking, the longer a building is